Los Angeles-based producer Eric Valentine has worked with some phenomenal rock acts, including Slash, Queens of the Stone Age, Smash Mouth and Third Eye Blind. Eric let us inside Barefoot Studios to shed some light on the techniques used to create the guitar sounds on some of the classic records he's produced. In this part, Eric shows us how he captured classic martial tones when recording legendary guitarist Slash. Okay, so this setup, um, you might be able to guess, uh, is a representative of the type of stuff that was used on the Slash records uh, that I worked on. Um, you can tell that by the little Slash logo on the amp. Um, this is actually uh, one of his uh, signature heads that um, he was working on developing while we were uh, working on the first record and into the second record. Um, uh, I believe the prototypes were done uh, right near the beginning of the second record that I did with him, and so we, we used this amp um, almost exclusively on the uh, on the second record. Um, we still had some of his original modified Marshalls around that um, we, we grabbed at times to use, but um, but this is uh, they did an amazing job uh, recreating the the two amp modified Marshall types that Slash has really you know gotten the best results from. Uh, there's a, a mythological original amp that was used on the Appetite record that was uh, modified by a guy that was working at SIR. They rented the amp and, uh, you know, were blown away by the sound of the amp. They used it to record that record and then just kept trying to come up with excuses to not give it back. And uh, at a certain point, it, it ended up going back to SIR and no, nobody really knows what happened to it after that. But um, there is a fair amount of information online about what the mods were to that amp. Um, the guy that did them is uh, still around and um, uh, actually makes an amp of his own that's based on those, those modifications. And then he also had a JCM 800 that had been modified, which is what we used a lot on the first record uh, that uh, we worked on together. So those two modes um, are on this amp, and uh, it's a great sounding modified Marshall type sound. It's a really, really great head. Um, so in once we got into the second record and we were using the head a lot, I was like, I, I, I absolutely want to have one of these as part of my collection and ended up buying one. Uh, so we're doing that and then a uh, Marshall 412 cab. Um, this is the you know 1960 vintage uh, version cab. Um, it's got vintage 30 speakers in it. Uh, that's what uh, Slash used uh, in his cabs as well. There's uh, four mics uh, on this, this guy. Um, this is a, a very tried and true setup, and that was a, a lot of, um, um, you know, what was going on with, with the Slash stuff. It's, it was really a different type of approach than, than like the Queen's record, where everything's an experiment. Like everything has to be something that nobody's ever done before, whereas this is, okay, we're going to do a part, let's go with the Les Paul and the Marshall, like every time, because that's his thing. And so, um, so, the, you know, there's a, a really great combination of mics that just works great for this type of a setup. And so um, there's an SM57. This is actually a, a 56, which is a, an older version of it that has the built-in mount. This particular one just sounds nice. Um, a 421 and a Royer 121, you know. So the 57 is kind of a brighter sound. Um, the 421 has a really aggressive kind of... Uh, um, very in-your-face kind of mid-rangey thing, and then um, the Royer uh, gets some great low end, and so I would make sure to have all three of these up, and uh, you know just kind of blend between them and to, to balance out how bright, how aggressive, how warm you want it, just by blending the microphones. Um, and then it, that allows you to set the amp in a way that um, is getting where it responds the way slash wanted to respond you know sometimes he would need more brightness to just have the attack you know for the definition the part that he was playing and so then i can balance that by leaning more on the warmer mics um, to just try and keep things so it all stays real musical you know slash is really known for having this really great defined attacky rhythm guitar sound and so um, I liked getting as much detail out of that as possible so you could just really hear every single pick, you know, pick hit on the, on the string when he's playing all these cool sort of muted uh, rhythm guitar parts and stuff. So, um, so yeah, these guys are really just hanging out right in front of the center of the speakers. And then on the amp, you know, it, the, the settings would vary a little bit here and there, but there was one thing that was always pretty important. Um, the, you know, the preamp gain was never really like all the way up. It would be maybe around six or seven, something like that, five, six, seven. 
um, not oversaturated, but the, the real trick was setting the master volume on the amp. And there's this really cool sweet spot where it just starts to break up the power section, the power tubes on the amp. And, you know, for me, that's always this moment where you get this sort of, um, this slightly more in your face sound because the final stage of the amp, the output tubes themselves start to clip. And it's a, it's a just sort of brighter, more immediate sound. Uh, when the master volume is is down more, you're just hearing the distortion of the previous stage being fed through, and it's it's slightly darker sound than than when you when you push the master section. So there's you know at times a lot of tweezing with that, but you know most of the time it was right on the brink of of having the actual power tubes distort. And when you've got you know four 6550s or EL34s it's fucking loud as shit. And so, you know, these amps were just floored all the time uh, while we were recording. We even um, built a special uh, isolation booth for him so he could play and listen to regular monitor speakers, not have to have headphones on while we were tracking. Um, and also have a guitar cab in the room with him to be able to hear and feel his guitar while he was playing. Um, it was all just part of trying to just manage the volume of the, of the amps because having them turned up that loud was such a, an important part of, of the sound, a really cool part of the sound. These three mics would be blended a lot of times um, for the rhythm sound, um, so they get a much more uh, close up, very defined, a lot of detail uh, for all the rhythm stuff. And for lead stuff, I would typically put a mic out in front of the amp further away, um, just to make sure that the lead guitar stuff, even though he, he's really comfortable using the same guitar, the same amp, the same speakers. Um, we can have the lead guitar sound just have an inherently different quality than the rhythm guitar sound. It makes it much easier when you're mixing to uh, have them just differentiate from each other and not all just turn into one sound. Um, and so putting a mic out in front um, really helps that a lot. Uh, in this case, I'm using a, a C12A. Um, the C12A is this sort of oddball kind of middle of this uh, evolution of AKG microphones. It's, you know, started off as a C12, which is a very tall uh, cylindrical mic uh, that has a tube in it. And, uh, and then it evolved to the C12A, where they replaced the tube with a new Vista, which was this kind of weird half, halfway between a tube and a transistor kind of thing. Um, and then the C12A ended up evolving into a C414. That's why this really looks a lot like a C414. Um, but all of those mics, the original C12, the C12A, and the early 414s all have the same capsule in them. They all have the same CK12 capsule. Um, so this mic has one of those capsules and it's a pretty hi-fi sounding mic. So lots of, lots of low end, lots of high end. And when you're getting away from the speaker cabinet like this, it's, it's a nice choice because it counteracts the sort of mid-ranginess of this position. And, uh, and I found that, you know, it ends up um, uh, making it more, uh, more of a balanced sound. It doesn't get too thin and mid-rangey. Um, and so in this case, I've got it um, on uh, the infamous mic robot. And um, uh, it's, it's important in this context because you've got four speakers that are all projecting the same sound. And those four signals sort of converge at a certain point in front of the amp. And um, the phase interaction of all four of those speakers changes dramatically, even if you move a little bit. You know, the timing between how far the mic is to the upper left speaker versus the bottom right speaker changes pretty dramatically as you move just a little bit. And so this is one of those th you know, situations where Without this mic robot thing, I would be running back and forth just trying it this way and then that way. Let's try it down here and up here and just try and find that perfect sort of phasing balance between all of the speakers. And you end up having a lot of control over, you know, how present it is or if it's a little more diffused sounding because it's, uh, there's some phase cancellation going on because you put it off center a little bit. There's a lot of stuff that you can do to sort of tweak with and give it, you know, its own unique personality and, and be musical um, all at the same time. Uh, so 
So this guy's on the robot and that allows me to sit in the control room and listen to the speakers in there while somebody's playing and just, you know, tweeze around with moving the mic around and try and find my sweet spot while I'm actually in the control room listening on the speakers um, in there. And uh, the, the other part of this is that um, the amp's being fed from a reamp um, and we did a, uh, quite a lot of that on on the Slash record, and it's, it's, a, it's a setup that I, I really prefer. Um, so what's happening is, in the control room, or even if the player is playing out here, I have them plug into a DI first, um, and uh, come out of the DI into a reamp, so I can capture a perfectly clean DI signal, um, as well as then the amp signal in real time. And uh, so in this case, what I'm doing is, uh, I have a DI in the control room, I have the guitar plugged into the DI, um, it goes to the computer, it comes out of the computer, goes to the reamp, and then to the head. Um, so that allows me to capture performances, then I can tweak sounds after the fact if I want to. Um, if a year later we want to change the guitar sound, I can do that. I can plug it through a different amp, I can mic it different, I can do whatever. Um, so it, it offers some really great flexibility and also I think is is helpful in the workflow so I'm, I'm not having to wear people out just playing parts over and over again. I can have them just play at one time. I've got a clean DI signal and I can just loop it while I'm losing my mind trying to find the right mics and place things and, and going crazy. And then once I get it set, I can have them come back in and go, okay, here it is, this is, this is the sound, check it out. Um, so we, we did that a lot on this and we'll be able to demonstrate that more once we get into the, uh, the control room. So, um, so yeah, that, that, this is really, uh, you know, a very simple but incredibly effective uh, setup that was used for almost all of the Slash stuff that, that we worked on. Now we're in the control room with the uh, Slash setup. Um, that's why I'm holding Les Paul. One of the things I run into a lot uh, with guitars whenever recording is just tuning issues. And um, one of the problems is that uh, because of the the frets and the way it's laid out, it is um, inherently a tempered tuning. And so um, it doesn't really accommodate some of the uh, subtle changes that will sweeten certain notes. So like, you know, I'm playing this, this G major chord a bunch, and in order to get this to sound, um, as good as it sounds right now, which isn't actually perfect, but it's close enough for the example. Um, I have to tune this G string a little bit flat. So when you hear it as a fourth, it definitely sounds flat. When you hear it as a third, it sounds in tune. So, sounds in tune there, doesn't sound in tune there. So, um, it's something all guitar players have to deal with it um, when they're playing different types of chord shapes, um, transitioning from playing rhythm stuff to solo stuff. Um, you know, uh, Slash definitely has uh, as good of patience as a, a lot of people, uh, anybody else I've worked with, with guitar tuning, but you know, everybody at a certain point just, <laughs> uh, just loses their minds with it. It's just, it's just endless trying to keep guitars in tune. Um, and so, so that's a good tuning for all these, uh, all these sort of major bar chords. And then, so if I was going to switch to a lead sound, so now I switch to the C12A. Um, I, I tune the G string sharp again, uh, so it, it sounds better for fourths. There was uh, a few mics up close on speakers um, out in the room. There's uh, a C12A that was further away. Um, so we can check out each of these mics um, as we go. Um, there's uh, the 57, which you can hear by itself, uh, pretty bright. Um, the 421, um, also 
kind of on the bright side, not a ton of low end, but a really nice presence to it. Um, here's the Royer. There's all your low end. And then the C12A out in front. And so that one, you can just kind of hear a little bit of the space around the sound a little bit more. It's further back. Um, so with this round of stuff, um, uh, I was really digging um, uh, more of the 421 with the, the Royer for, for this time around, for whatever reason. Um, you know, sometimes the 57 will win out, sometimes the 421, or sometimes, you know, all three of them will go. Um, and there's a little bit of EQing going on here. Uh, so let's see, it's mostly just uh, some subtle little mid-range boosts. So on the 57. That's without it. That's with it. Just a nice little uh, mid-range presence there. Um, here we go with the, uh, the 421. So this one, there's a mid-range boost um, and, you know, this sort of upper high end. So that's without it. That's with it. Um, so the, the upper high end thing just kind of opens it up a little more. That's without it. Uh, that's with it. Just adds that kind of um, airier uh, high end that, um, you know, makes the whole thing sort of just broader sounding. Um, okay, so here's the the Royer 121. That's with the EQ. So this, I'm pulling out some low mid stuff and boosting some uh, some really low stuff like uh, down around 80 hertz, something like that. Here's without the EQ. That's with it. And then the C12A, uh, this one, uh, was mostly just adding some highs and lows. You know, um, when you when you pull back away from the amp like that, it can it can start to get real mid rangey, which is kind of nice because uh, it just sits in a different place than the other stuff. But without the EQ, it's just a, it's a little too thin, Oops. and so. That's with the EQ, without, with it. So, so my favorite combination um, was these two guys right here. So the 421 with the uh, the Royer. Um, so. Nice balance. You get the, the presence from the, the 421. Um, for some reason, this time around, 421 seems to be representing the mid-range better without it being sort of harsh or small sounding. And then that Royer does great for all that low-end stuff. If you wanted even more presence, you can add in this 57. Um, but I think right now my favorite is definitely the the 421 and the and the 121. Um, and so then you know the C12A is just a really different, a, a whole other sort of personality for the sound, and is really great for having it you know, a lead sound um, that will not interfere with the, uh, the rhythm guitar sound. With the, the C12A, which is more the um, lead guitar kind of vibe, um, we have the mic mounted on this, uh, this mic robot. And so this allows us to, um, you know, have a particular position. I've got it in a spot that um, I'm... Um, and so I can store that. I'm gonna store this as uh, preset one. Um, you know, we can cruise around some different places and uh, see what kind of difference this makes. So I'm just gonna go off, go off to the right a bunch. Um, 
so you can hear it um, getting uh, a lot darker. Even darker, more mid-rangey. More diffused, more phasey kind of stuff. And so then, uh, if we want to go back to the place that we were before, I can just uh, recall where we were before, and uh, the mic will just find its way back there. It, you know, it doesn't move super fast because it's nice to have uh, this kind of resolution where um, I can move tiny, tiny little bits um, if we want. All that presence come back as we get back into that sort of focus point that's equidistant between the four speakers. Yeah, so that's the uh, that's the microbot, you know, being able to dial in your your uh, your sweet spot in front of the in front of the cabinet. Um, so then the whole thing, all these mics right now, um, get some together a bus. They show up here um, on the console, and uh, for this, uh, I'm using a little bit of an 1176 to compress it. Uh, right now, there's nothing on there, but. That's with the 1176. And it's a great compressor to just kind of pull the whole thing more in your face. And so um, with that guy on there, uh, you get more of that initial attack when it first comes in. So yeah, there you go. For more top-end guitar recording tips, be sure to check out the other two parts in this Eric Valentine Guitar Techniques series. If you enjoyed this video, make sure you like and share it and subscribe to the Sound on Sound YouTube channel. Also, check out some of our other videos right here. Thanks for watching.